Welcome to The Hollywood Outsider, an award-winning weekly entertainment podcast available at thehollywoodoutsider.com, as well as whatever podcast app you currently use. My name is Aaron Peterson. I'll be your host for this special episode of The Hollywood Outsider. And as our loyal listeners know, on occasion, we like to bring you interviews with typically independent filmmakers to give you an insight into both what goes into getting their films made, as well as insight into the respective art itself. This time we have something special. Author Daniel Cross was invited by George A. Romero's widow, Suzanne, to complete a legacy of sorts. See, George A. Romero, if you don't know, I don't know how you don't know, but he was the creator of Night of the Living Dead, pretty much the orchestrator of the modern zombie film. Uh, He made several more zombie films, including Day of the Dead, Dawn of the Dead, etc. And before his untimely passing, just a couple of years back, what he was doing was working on a novel that would bring a conclusion, because there were certain limitations in filmmaking, they would bring a conclusion to his world of the undead. And he wasn't able to complete it, obviously. So Suzanne reached out to author Daniel Cross personally and said, would you like to come and complete this work? I would love George A. Romero's, I'm paraphrasing, George A. Romero's work to be completed out there. You're an exceptional author. Would you like to complete this? And I, and I must say, he's, an, he's a celebrated author in his own right. You might not know the name off the top of your head because we're typically movies and TV exclusively. But he's worked in this job. He's worked in this field. Uh, he's inspired stories that you know. He worked with Del Toro on The Shape of Water and Troll Hunters. He's a renowned artist and he does great work. And here he takes on probably his biggest task, which is completing someone else's legacy. And can you even imagine? You're taking on someone who created and popularized an entire culture and world, a genre of film that has been. Well, especially the last 10, 15 years, it's just blown up and become this this thing. And Romero is the grandfather of all of that. And now Daniel has to come in and he has to take on this mantle and use his own words, create his own world and morph it with George A. Romero's. And here's what I have to say. Going into the book, I was very, I wouldn't say skeptical because I was excited But I was also kind of cautious because whenever you have two different visions coming together, it can go several different ways. Either you will come into it and you will specifically see the differences in ideas or idealism, or you really see a a heavier aspect of one or the other. But here I can honestly tell you that I don't know where Romero ends and Daniel Cross begins. He's done a very seamless job of blending these worlds together and creating one complete work that is equal parts Daniel Cross and George A. Romero. It's fascinating. I, I think he did a wonderful job with this book. If you are a fan of zombies, ghoul, <laughs> the living dead culture, you're going to want to read this as soon as possible. It is an epic novel. It is a bit of a monster, and it's worth every page. It, it's just worth the effort. And I, I talk about it in the interview, but Daniel has a, an author's note at the end, and many, many books do where they kind of go over their brief history with with the book. And he goes into very exquisite detail about the book and coming to create the book and his journey with George A. Romero. And typically, I don't read author's notes, and I said that in the interview. I don't. This is a great one. This is kind of like a short story all in itself, and I, and I highly recommend it. Um, he says several things that I just find fascinating. And you know Cross loves this world because, A, it's his favorite film of all time. And also, he even said this, George's films not only helped construct my moral compass, but also radically shaped my artistic vision. That's more than a fan. That's an artist who appreciates the art itself. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, I just want to tell you guys, you can find this on August 4th, The Living Dead Hits Bookstores. You can pre-order your copy now. And I recommend, if you're listening to this before August 4th, do that. Because if you pre-order it before August 4th, you can take a copy of your receipt, upload it to McMillian's website, and get an exclusive poster only for people who pre-order the book. It's well worth it. Go to danielcross.com. You can find links that will take you directly there. It is definitely worth it. We also have links in our show notes. So go to our show notes. There's links right there. It'll take you right to it. Please do that. Pre-order the book. Take the receipt. Get a copy of the poster before August 4th. I think you're going to love that. But you know what? Let's get into the interview. This is a great interview. We talk about his, his history, how he came to be, Romero's films, the book itself, there's a whole lot of tangible detail in this, and all I'm doing is rambling. So let's get into the interview with author Daniel Cross and his and Romero's book, The Living Dead, out August 4th. Here you go. Hey, this is Daniel Cross. Hey, Daniel. How are you? Good, good. How you doing? I, I'm doing wonderful. You, I believe, are in Chicago, right? I'm not too far from you. 
Um, yeah, where are you? Uh, based out of Rockford. Oh, I had no idea. <laughs> Small world. Small world. Yeah. All right, I am here with Daniel Cross, who is the co-author of George A. Romero's last novel, The Living Dead. I want to talk more about you before we get into the book, if that's okay, Daniel. Yeah, sure. Okay. I open every interview with the same question. When did you know you wanted to get involved in filmmaking, or in your case, writing? What was there a specific moment for you? No, there wasn't a moment, but it was... So, I, I mean, I started writing when I was very young, so I don't know, first grade maybe. Um, and I had a a friend in the neighborhood. I grew up in a small town in Iowa, and we essentially would get together and draw monsters. Mm-hmm. So he had his set of monsters, and I had my set of monsters, and we had you know school folders we'd put them in. And I think writing grew out of a desire to have the monsters do something. So we would write uh, monster battle stories. Okay. So they were, you know, not much more intricate than Godzilla smashing up against, you know, Mothra or something. They, you know, they were, there was nothing to them, but it became really fun to do. And we did that for years. And eventually my friend um, sort of uh, grew out of it or whatever. I kept on writing stories that got longer and longer and even included human beings in it. And, you know, by the time I was in middle school, I was writing at least novella length stuff. Um, Certainly by high school, I was writing novel length stuff. That doesn't mean, you know, they were any good, but uh, I was certainly in a mode of completing things. So I kind of got over that hump early where I would set to doing something and I would, you know, even if it was the size of the novel, I would, I would write the whole thing. I was reading through your author's note and it was shocking to me. We have a lot of commonality in, in terms of, well, for one thing, your mom lets you watch horror movies as a little kid too, which shout out to all those moms. Yeah. <laughs> you, you watched Night of the Living Dead as a five or six year old. It stuck with you. I mean, for me, it was Evil Dead and, and Friday the 13th, but why did that film resonate with you so strongly? Well, I think one of the reasons is that it was always on, you know, unlike Evil Dead or Friday the 13th, those were properly copyrighted. Uh, Night Living Dead famously wasn't. And so right. anyone would play it at any time. So it was just always on through my childhood. Every October it would be on, you know, multiple times. And even throughout the year there, we had a late night, you know, late night horror show. And not, not, it wasn't local, but it was broadcast in our town didn't have a horror host per se, but they would, you know, play different horror movies. That's where I first saw things like the Wicker Man and stuff like that. Um, but I'm sure that they played Living Dead uh, semi-regularly there. So it was just a movie that was always on. My mom really liked it. It was safe in a way. Uh, it's mm-hmm. It was old enough that if you wanted to find camp value in it, you could. I think the movie also plays can play very seriously. But if, if you're with a mom who's laughing and yelling at Barbara to stop falling down <laughs> and all that stuff, yeah. there's certainly, there's, there can, there can be a, 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 you can create a safe distance from it if you want. So it wasn't something that was terrifying me. And I also, during that same time growing up, I was being fed by my mom, a, a constant diet of Twilight Zone. So I was very familiar with this, this 1960s black and white horror genre. And, you know, there were other films as I grew older that became important to me, but I really latched on to Night of the Living Dead. I think it was partially because even though I was just a kid, there's a complexity to it that was appealing. Uh, The characters are really good. The acting was really good. Uh, the, The ending, no matter how much fun we were having during the movie, the ending was there was no, the ending was never a laughing matter. No, like when no. Ben gets shot at the end, uh, whether I was watching it with my mom or as an adult watching it at some, some theater screening, I mean, the, the place gets pin, pin drop quiet. I mean, that, that's always a, a shocker. So it just had all these great elements to it. Um, it was very understandable as a kid because it was a single location horror movie and, the, the plot was just, you know, don't let those things inside, you know? So, so it's very, very simple to grasp as a kid. 
which really allowed you to focus on the, the dynamics of the characters. Well, that's about, I mean, you have the societal issues too. I mean, you have people that just lose their minds. I mean, the danger is just as much within the walls as it is without, which made the movie stand out, especially for its simplicity. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's something I think a kid can latch on to pretty easily. You know, that was the era of stranger danger and all that. So you, you had a sense as a kid that the home was a safe space that you could lock the doors and close the blinds and you <laughs> might be safe. And this was a movie that was really like, no, you're not safe. You're not safe because they might break through the windows, but you're also not safe because the people you're inside with uh, could be a danger. Your mom, my mom should have hung out. They, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, did she, was she one of those where you'd have uh, relatives or friends say, well, your mom shouldn't let you watch those things. You know, I don't, I don't think so. I think actually my dad would have probably said that, but he wasn't always aware of it. Right. Uh, she would, she would more or less let me rent whatever I wanted to from the local video store, but I can't remember if it was said aloud or just implied, but I really wasn't supposed to share that the knowledge of what I had rented with my dad, like that was, it was pretty much something that was kept on, on the down low. She was very open to that kind of stuff. She, uh, she was a horror fan, you know, she didn't have Night of the Dead posters up or anything, but she, she really got into, like she had favorite horror films mm -hmm. and that was enough. She read Stephen King books. She, she had, just enough of interest in the, the genre that it became something kind of safe and special between us. Like it was, I had two sisters and it wasn't really something I don't think that she shared with them. Uh, and it wasn't something she shared with my dad. So it was really a, a kind of special thing that just she and I had. That's beautiful. Yeah. Well, what, so what was your journey from growing up and writing your own stories, monster tales, whatever they evolved into, into finding your way as a published author? Well, you know, in in high school, I made a, a movies. I made a, I got a, a essentially a VHS camera mm -hmm. and uh, made tons of movies with my friends. Uh, a lot of them, most of them were remakes. Um, I actually made a, a teenage version of Night Living Dead with my friends. Oh, that's great. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I still have it. It's, you know, it's about eight minutes long. Just put it on YouTube. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's not good, but it's, it's funny. <laughs> um, so I, so in college I sort of got sidetracked and I got, although I'd wanted it, I wanted to be a novelist all my life. I kind of got sidetracked with movies and I spent my college time and then, um, pretty much my twenties, uh, in movies directing, uh, mostly documentaries. And then I got burnout on that sort of, and I, 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 I rediscovered my love of reading. I think a lot of authors go through this maybe around the college age where they start reading all the stuff they're supposed to read. Mm -hmm. um, and I did that for years. Uh, and then I, I got, I found my way back to the, the books I really loved and that energized me to return to what I'd always wanted to be was a, which was a novelist. And as a bonus, one thing you have to do when working in movies is you have to work with a lot of people. And I didn't love that. I'm happiest when just alone in my office. So part of it was just satisfying my desire to be a hermit. Um, <laughs> so I wrote a book and I don't, I don't really have a hard luck story. I, I wrote a book and I sold it. That was my first book. And I haven't, you know, stopped since. Well, what's crazy, you're talking about, you've, you've worked on movies and, and whatnot as well. You've collaborated with Del Toro twice, Troll Hunters and The Shape of Water. How, how did that even come together? Uh, I mean, the short version is that uh, Guillermo Red Rotters, mm. uh, which is a, a novel I wrote, sorry. Right. No, and I, no, I um, liked it and was looking, at the time was looking, or shortly thereafter was looking for a, a co-author for, Troll Hunters, which was before it was a TV show or anything. It was this novel. And I was kind of the right guy at the right time. It was a, a dark horror-ish. The book is actually quite darker and for an older reader than uh, the Netflix show is. 
so yeah, we got together and we talked about it and we did that. And, it, and during our talks about how to, how to formulate that book um, is when we hatched uh, The Shape of Water. And then that became the novel that he and I wrote and then the, the, new, the movie that he made. So all that happened in a sort of short period of time, really. Because I wanted to ask you, and I don't want to spend too much time on it because I want to talk about The Living Dead, but I want to ask you, because Shape of Water took on a narrative all of its own. I mean, it managed to, that, that rare thing that movies do, which is where it crossed artistic taste. You know, the Oscars mm -hmm. in years past, many times would ever, never even acknowledge a film like The Shape of Water. And it, and it did. And you were instrumental in that story. Were you surprised by that? Were you surprised by the accolades and the fact that these Hollywood elite were actually raving about this? Well, yes and no. I mean, I, I thought that it would be really good. Like I, I, you know, just speaking about the movie for a minute, I, I didn't have any doubt that it would be a good movie. I, I really thought it was in Cameron's sweet spot and both he and I have a deep abiding sympathy for monsters, <laughs> you know, going way back to my early Night Living Dead, uh, where, you know, and growing up on Romero movies where he became increasingly sympathetic to zombies. So I thought, I had no doubt that it, would, it was going to be good, but I was very surprised by the uh, amount of people who liked it. I thought I expected it to be a smaller art house type picture. I, I would have never guessed that so many people would have been so transfixed by it. I just thought the, just the element of a woman in love with a, a, a monster more or less, and physically, in addition to that, would have put off more people. And I, but I think it's great. I mean, I think essentially I underestimated you. I think everybody did. It was a, it was the one of the best surprises because if you're a genre fan, that's all you want is for these movies to actually be applauded for what they do, which we love them. But a lot of times, you know, especially the Oscars and things like that, they don't acknowledge them very often. So it was it was a really nice surprise to be like, hey, you acknowledge genre fans. That's that's wonderful. There's lots of movies like this out there. Find them. <laughs> yeah, and hopefully all those people who saw Shape of Water, you know, hopefully a lot of them, you know, worked backwards from there and said, well, maybe I'll check out, you know, the book. Some of some of the yeah, well, the book obviously, but also um, some of the horror movies that Guillermo made and some of the horror movies that he grew up on, some of Romero's movies and and the Creature from the Black Lagoon and sort of my 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 curiosity is always whether these things crack open genres for people. I don't know if they do or not. You know, I'd like to think that Shape Water led to other people digging deeper into genre um, movies and fiction, but I, I don't really have any evidence of that. I, f I mean, I'm just going off conversations with our audience and one. I feel like when you and I were probably kids, it was more prevalent. Nowadays, there's so much new all the time. I, I feel mm -hmm. like they, they get that hit. They look, some of them, the very diehards will look into it, but a lot of them will just move on to the next thing. So I, I wonder the same thing as you. I, I'm wondering, like, who does yeah. it crack? Who do, who do these successes crack and become prominent with? Yeah, that's, I mean, even, even in the last, like, when did Shape of Water come out? But even in the, the, the time since then, I feel like the, the chances, and it's weird because in this period right now, movie theaters aren't open. Right. But it almost feels like when, when they open again, Will there even be that kind of period where people can focus on a single movie? I think there will be for blockbusters, but it seems increasingly unlikely for smaller movies to have any kind of foothold that lasts more than a, a week or so. Yeah, I think books still have a, a are positioned more like they always have been and have a longer tail. Um, in that sense, I think a book can come out and it's not all about the first week. Um, and it can, can take months and months to really find its feet. And that's still okay. And your book couldn't have picked a better time to come out, honestly. Like <laughs> the timing is perfect, I think for, for various reasons, which I'll, I'll talk about shortly. Well, it's, it is and it isn't. I mean, originally the book was going to come out in June and was going to have this, you know, giant tour associated with it. Uh, uh, so then there's nothing we can really replace that with. That would have been a, you know, promotionally, that would have been a huge boon to the book and it's the awareness of it. Uh, and that just 
got scuttled. But then again, it's not just like that happened to this book. It happened to every book. So, you know, it's not like the, the playing field is still level. And a lot of people are at home, so they, they need something to do. And this would be a good yeah. thing for them to pick up. I mean, the book industry, I think, has, hit, has taken hits too. But I think it's been fairly resilient for exactly those reasons. People are at home and people are reading books. You know, speaking of, aside from Living Dead, what's what has been your most personal novel? Like the one for you that screams Daniel Cross? Well, I think about a couple maybe. The Rodgers is the one that is most autobiographical. The uh, the main character in Rodgers is very much based on me as a, a teenager. Aside from that, I mean, I guess that's the answer. I guess Rodgers is is the answer. There there are other ones that mean a lot to me in various ways. Scowler does, but Scowler's so intense that I don't even like to think about it much. And there's something about my recent book, uh, Blood Sugar, that has a special place in my heart. You've got a lot of heart in your books there. That's always a good thing. Yeah. So now we're, we're at The Living Dead. We've arrived at The Living Dead. So before we get into the, the details, give us your quick synopsis to, to people, without spoiling anything, what The Living Dead is about. So The Living Dead, to sort of nutshell it, is the conclusion of the zombie story that George Romero began with Night of the Living Dead, and then continue with Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead, and three other sequels. So it reboots the zombie uprising to day one and takes it uh, and follows it for 15 years, you know, through the rise and the beginning of the fall of the zombies. And that's not really a spoiler. It's essentially, you know, if, if you just logically play it out in 15 years, there's not that many humans left and zombies are going to start to rot. I mean, there's no more new zombies being made, so they're going to start to fall apart. So it's, it's, uh, it is, you know, it's a giant book. It's 650 pages of what, what George wanted to be the great American zombie novel, the zombie novel to end all zombie novels. (laughs) You know, it, he, he had the very, very first word with Night of the Living Dead in what his, like, the modern reinvention of a zombie would be, this kind of flesh-eating mm-hmm. uh, undead creature. And this is the final word. You, this is the bookend to that original film. Um, and it follows a cross-section of Americans. Romero was a very America-focused filmmaker, I think. Um, and the films were about America, usually in, in a not very... Uh, optimistic tone. And this book follows a cross section of uh, uh, Americans dealing with the initial crisis um, all the way to trying to pick up the pieces and figure out what would a better America look like and how might we create it. Now you've kind of, I mean, you've done so much research on this world, the fandom, everything else to, to put this, put this book together. One thing I want to ask you is what did you come to the conclusion of why people love zombies and Romero's undead in particular like what did you find through all your research and everything else that really stood out to you like this is what draws people well I don't know if I found anything in the research for the book that answered that but just my general feeling about it is that it's the idea that I mean there's Romero stumbled into what I think is possibly the, the greatest metaphor of our times the, the, the idea of the zombie. Um, his films, really, I think his films taught me what a metaphor was when I was uh, growing up and I saw Dawn of the Dead. Um, really began to show me, oh, this, you can talk about something and not talk about it. You can, you can refer to something artfully through uh, a work of art and, you know, and make a point about something completely different. So the zombie is a very malleable uh, metaphor because it has no no one's face or rather it has everyone's face and is a mass is a shapeless mass and that's key to to what I think the appeal is uh, most zombies are singular or I'm sorry most monsters are singular you have a Dracula or Frankenstein's monster or a creature from Black Lagoon but in, but zombies are are represent a group uh, a, a society or a, or a a segment of society. 
And so it's, it's extremely fun to, to, and, and uh, effective to work on a canvas that involves an entire subsection of society uprising against another. These are, these are insurrection stories and uh, revolt narratives. And I think that's the appeal. You're being attacked by a, an army. Um, or if you are like George and you kind of are sympathetic to the zombies, you're this underclass that is attacking the, uh, the society that, or the class that is in control. Uh, so it's a very much a perfect way to play with class struggles. And I think even if people who are in the zombies don't think of it that way and conceive of it in those terms, I think subconsciously it's there. Now you're, I was reading your author's note, which, you know, I, I want to say it was, it was very deeply personal. I love that. I rarely read those <laughs> to be perfectly honest, but, but I read yeah. yours. It's a very deeply personal, almost, almost small novel on its own novella uh, of your meeting of George and how that evolved into, into what happened. I encourage everybody to read it, to get the full details, but you talked about something in that, that I thought was, you know, I, I've heard a, a ton of stories about George Romero over the years and a lot of them are the same ones, you know, st stay scared, stuff like that. I mean, the, the epitome of he just he just likes doing what he did. He could never break out. He could never do other films because he was in he was pigeonholed and whatnot. But you you talk about an anecdote that Romero, in terms of he was at a fan convention and you, that's the first time you met him, and he practiced his signature before conventions. Can you can you elaborate on that story? Because I just thought that was a very moving. Anecdote. Yeah, I mean, it's just a little anecdote. It wasn't yeah. during the time that I met him. Uh, it was actually when I was after he died, and I was had begun okay. to work on the project. I, I met his wife. I went up to Toronto to meet uh, Suze and conducted a long interview with her about all sorts of things. And she showed me various things of George of George's, and one of them was this pad of paper where he would practice his signature. Um, before fan conventions, because he was, you know, he was getting older and his, and his hand was shaky. Yeah, it was just this page of his autograph over and over and over in different pens. And I, yeah, and I found that very moving, that he was this guy who, you know, on the one hand did feel penned in. Uh, he, you know, he couldn't, get, he couldn't get a horror movie made. He could only get zombie movie made. And that's such a specific niche. Yeah, very much so. uh, And yet he, he still cared for his fans to the extent that he was, he'd practice his signature. So they it would look good on their stuff. And that to me was a, is a real encapsulation of what kind of guy he was. And in this day and age, I mean, if you've been to a fan convention, that's very impressive because so many of them just, you know, it's, it's a business for a lot of guys, but there, there's still a lot of, especially the old time talent that really treat it like this is, these are the people that made me who I am. I appreciate them. And it's such a, a moving anecdote. I thought, in that yeah. respect. So you've got your, your buddy, Chris Rowe, he introduced you to Romero and then you meet with Suzanne. They're instrumental in bringing you on board for, for this book. How, how do you, an avid fan react to being asked to essentially complete your hero's legacy? Uh, well, I, I, I was stunned for a while. I guess that's the only word for it, but I generally react to all news, good or bad by uh, attacking it right away. Mm -hmm. It's sort of my defense mechanism. So I just got to work very, very quickly. Um, I knew from what I read of the manuscript that existed and George's apparent goals for it, as well as, you know, my instincts of what I wanted to do with it, that it was going to be a, a big effort involving a lot of research. So I just, I got to it. I knew there was going to be a lot of research before I could uh, write or edit a word of it. So I got watching, you know, I started with the movies yet again and watched all those and watched them again with commentary tracks and, and then started digging into every interview of his I could find the more obscure, the better and reading scholarly analyses, analyses of his work and, and just trying to get a, a, a vast, but deep understanding of everything that he was, about and specifically when it came to zombies everything that he, everywhere he was headed with them because i knew this book was going to head 
further into the future than any of the zombie movies did. So I had to, I, one of the biggest challenges for me was using the clues I had to figure out what he was doing with this whole zombie thing. Well, where he, where he was going with it. What was the point of it all? So that was the first step. And then, you know, after interviewing, interviewing Sue's and other people, um, there were second and third and 50th steps, but, uh, <laughs> But yeah, you know, it, there, I guess your your question is probably, you know, was there a feeling of pressure? Um, or humbling. Yeah. I mean, humbling too, because I, I gotta, I have to feel anyone who's good at what they do to be asked by someone they really admire to complete, or this one's family to really to complete their legacy. That's a huge ask. It is, and Romero was my favorite artist of any art. I mean, he was my number one guy. So. Yeah, it was a. It felt like a very big responsibility, but I also knew that for better or worse, you know, regardless of how the book turned out, no one was going to take it any more seriously than I would. Like I was going to take it as if the, this were a, you know, half finished Rembrandt or Michelangelo piece. Like I was going to really uh, respect it and try to try, try to give try to give it the best chance to be the the deepest epic that could be that it could be and not skimp on anything and not try to make it uh, a gore fest and try to really lean into the things that George had been interested in, which was never zombie mayhem. That's of course in the book and in his movies, but that was never what he was really interested in. And the manuscript of this book made that clear, even clearer than before. So yeah, it was, there was pressure, but again, I, in, in a way I've been training for it all my life. So I think I had almost an athletic response in the sense that, okay, I made it to the, the big leagues. They called <laughs> me up to the pros and um, I just got to, I got to go swing the bat. Yeah. I mean, you even found what some, some chapters that he did for, for sale, right? I mean, the, the death of death, I think it was called where he, he did it and he would send pages out based on donations. Yeah, so a, a significant component to it was there was the, the initial manuscript that he had written for The Living Dead. And then I went on a hunt for, you know, everything I could find of his. And it's, a, it's kind of a long story, but uh, the short version is that I was able to use the Wayback Machine, which people who use the internet should will know what that is, to dig up remnants of his old website. He, around the year 2000, he had a, a short-lived website and uh, forgotten to time was that he had started, you know, way back then he had taken sort of an earlier run at the same concept of an epic zombie novel. And, you know, with, with that early internet optimism, he was going to do it entirely on the net and you could enter your email and for however many dollars you could get each chapter mailed to you. And I had heard of this and I looked, I looked it up and I, I found the remnants of the site that made it clear that this was a real thing. Um, and I knew a lot about George Romero and I did not know about this. And I knew a lot of people who knew a lot about George Romero and they didn't know about this. His wife didn't know about this. Uh, they'd all forgotten it if they had ever known. So uh, talking to uh, his wife, we were able to track down these pages and it was true that he only wrote two chapters, but they were really long chapters. That his two chapters were a hundred pages. <laughs> Those uh, are very long chapters. Yeah. Yeah. So I think what he what was remembered as two chapters was actually more like two sections. Uh, and in some ways, they really resembled the the Living Dead and what they were trying to do, but it was with a different cast of characters. Uh, it, it was just different, but it was great. It was uh, really good stuff. And so that was one of the many pieces that I had to put together, you know, because now that I had permission to include this and incorporate it into the book. So that was a whole new challenge of how do I take this, these separate characters and plug them in to the storyline? It didn't plug in. Nothing was that simple. It was really a matter of uh, being far more creative. I spent a lot of time just thinking, just sitting there like a statue and thinking how do I get these two pieces to reconcile in a way that's smooth and effective? Can character A be combined with character B? Can this part at the beginning of the newfound pages be 
near the end of the original book. I mean, I just had to, to mix and match and, you know, I couldn't use everything, but I, I uh, found ways uh, that were, I feel like were fairly elegant to use everything that I could. Is it tricky to, f- to do this when you're trying to capture someone else's voice and you, you're a writer, you already have your own voice. Is it hard to mesh those two? Um, I think in theory it could be, but um, it wasn't too bad here because I had, I had enough of his manuscript that I could uh, edit it. So the first thing I had to do is, was go through his book and edit. Because some of the pages he wrote were in great shape, but some, some were, you know, first drafts and needed, needed some work. Right. So once I had really gotten through the process of editing, I had just by, you know, by dint of doing that, had created the Romero Kraus voice which was, you know, just an amalgam of what it looks like when I edit George. Uh, <laughs> so then it was just a matter of continuing on with that. There are, there are certain stylistic little things that I, that I recognized that he did that I would try to uh, replicate. But generally, it was, a, it was a very smooth process. It wasn't, uh, it's a great question, but it's not an uh, exceptionally interesting answer. It actually went pretty easily. Oh, let me try another question. See if this is better. <laughs> when when you're doing all this research, here's the one thing I found. I I've, I noticed this recently. I've been rewatching Alfred Hitchcock movies with with a more critical eye because he's I like Romero. He's he's my Romero, right? So yeah. I'm, I'm rewatching his movies. I've always been a fan of them, but I watch them with a different eye because now I'm looking for details and thematic material mm-hmm. and things like. I'm just more critical. So when you're rewatching his movies, aside from Night of the Living Dead, because I feel like it's it's easy to pick from that. What did you take from that that you were surprised or you didn't realize before about his films? Anything? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I mean, one of the, the key things, and this is, it's a little, the answer is a little different than your question. Okay. But when I, when I really investigated his films and the uh, ancillary materials that went around them, the commentary tracks and, uh, the screenplays themselves and so forth, interviews that he did about the films. I began to pick up on something very, what ended up being very critical to the structure of the book. And that was his interest in zombie animals. Mm. Uh, which seems like a, maybe like a silly little thing, but ended up being really critical to how I uh, envisioned so much of what happens in the latter half of the book. Near the end of his life, you know, with him still thinking he had, you know, multiple movies yet to make, he was very interested in the idea of playing with the the zombie virus jumping to animals. Most notably, his movie Land of the Dead had a zombie rats scene that was in in the script right up until the end. And they just cut it for budgetary reasons. That would have been fantastic, Um, too. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and then he mentioned it in various other interviews that he was really thinking about this issue. And what was interesting to me, once I really thought about it, was that the zombie rats weren't attacking other rats. And that's kind of profound when you think about it, because the, the whole idea of the zombies is that they're these cannibalistic creatures. But if that were the case, zombie rats would be attacking living rats. Right, uh, but they weren't. They were they were attacking humans, and so that made me re reconfigure how I thought about zombies. They weren't cannibalistic. They were anti human. So what does that mean? And if if people suck, if the zombie, <laughs> yeah, well, essentially, yes. Uh, if if people if zombies are here to attack people, then it would seem that the zombies have a goal. And what does that goal mean? And what is what is the achieving of that goal look like? What is it? What does the country look like after that? What does nature look like after that? And it really, I mean, you know, I'll let the readers, readers of the book kind of figure out uh, what George and I think about that. But that's that began a, a long chain of thought that informed the the narrative and where it goes, particularly near the end. That brings me to something I want, you know, I alluded to it earlier. What what I found fascinating about everything in the, in the living dead is how timely it is. And what I mean by that is it's incredibly diverse in terms of the characters. 
there's this this aura of how society reacts in the face of catastrophe and collapse, which are prominent in the movies as well. Hospice and the fate of the elderly is in there. The mm. the the world self correcting itself to a degree, and there's even a little bit of mob mentality to it. So, oh, yeah. it, I mean, even you had to be a little bit surprised how close you were coming to the real world at this point. Oh yeah, <clears throat> but you know, on the one hand, I'm, I'm shocked. I mean, no one could have seen us being in the grips of a not a zombie pandemic, but a, a biological pandemic, and I don't think anyone could have pinpointed this year would be the year that uh, mob violence against uh, black people would, would reach such a fever pitch. But then again, uh, by the same token, Lumiere was always able to be ahead of the curve, sometimes way, way ahead of the curve uh, when it came to these things. He tended to be a little bit of a soothsayer uh, when it came to predicting what was going to be the next big American crisis point. Mm -hmm. Um, So, no, I didn't. I, I I couldn't have imagined it being this topical, but I I never doubted it'd be topical. Just like the ending of The Living Dead is still topical. Some things, you know, his general point that we can't pull together in a crisis. I mean, that's the that's the guiding uh, precept of his entire catalog of work so that we cannot we can't pull together in a crisis. And more specifically, modern Americans can't pull together in a crisis. And once you think about that, you got to think about, well, why not? What's, what's in American history that prevents us from pulling together? Well, it's because we have this history of, you know, uh, yeah. ens- enslavement and, and creating uh, different uh, various stratuses of society. Uh, so, you know, and there's a, I'm not going to spoil it, but there's a, there's a major element of, mob violence near the end of this book that's uh, very critical to the plot that's you know more or less uh, militia taking things uh, into their own hands against what you might call a peaceful protest so uh yeah it's uh it's a trip i mean but romero was always always pulling this amazing trick of seeing into the future well, and that's one thing I've always found fascinating about his films, and I think every fan does, as I'm sure you can attest, is the societal, just the intelligence that was there. You know, I mean, I mean so many people, if you talk about, oh, I love zombie movies and Night of the Living Dead, why do you love it? Well, you know, zombies, Barbara. No, it, it, was, yeah. the, it was the intelligence that was there. The horror is real because it, it seems like that's how it would play out in the real world. Would this craziness happen? That's how people would react. It was so close to human nature and very intellectual in that respect. And the book captures that gloriously, I would say. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And, and I'm curious, when you're, when you're approaching this, when you're writing it, what was more difficult for you to, to kind of grapple with? Was it Romero's specific mold of a zombie and making sure that you paid fair homage to that? Or was it the societal issues and trying to make sure that, that you had that good blend? Well, it was both. I, I definitely, when I went through all of his books and all of his writings, um, one of the things we uncovered was a long lost short story that was never published. That was from the point of view of a zombie that really helped, uh, helped me get a sense of how zombies think and act and move. So I had, I I created a big cheat sheet of all the facts that we knew about Romero zombies, that they could do this and that, and this is how they felt. And this is how they were able to smell and uh, that they weren't really hungry. They were just hunting um, things they didn't do, things they couldn't do, uh, rare occurrences, you know, there'd be like small examples in films of uh, a zombie driving a car or a zombie riding a horse, you know, all these little things that they could do. So I always had a pretty solid sense of what, what a zombie could and couldn't do and what their physical uh, abilities were. So that was kind of the easy part, really. That's, that's just kind of mechanical and um, knowing the rules. Much more uh, important were the getting the Romero stuff right. Yeah, um, I imagine. You know, but I, you know, I will say at the end of the day, this isn't a ghost-written Romero book. You know, there's a reason my name's on the cover too. Absolutely, it's, it's an ultimate. It's ultimately a Romero Krauss book. There, there, there wasn't enough of this book 
to just patch it up. There was a, you know, significant chunks missing. So I can kind of go all day talking about trying to get Romero's philosophies down right, but, but that would be misleading because it's also mine. Uh, this is also my book. And, and ultimately I, I have, I'm going to imbue it with uh, a lot of my viewpoints and enthusiasms and biases that that's all going to be baked in too. Uh, all I can say is that I, you know, literally growing up on Romero books or Romero movies, uh, that stuff is so baked into my DNA that although I'm not biologically related to him, uh, I'm close. <laughs> you adopted? <laughs> yeah. You know, that brings me to my last, I've got a couple like quick questions I want to ask you, but it, this is kind of an important one for me. So reading the the book, when people are reading it, again, without spoiling it, obviously, do it without context maybe, but what is the moment for you that's like, that is the Daniel moment. Like that's the one you're most proud hmm. of injecting in the book. That's your own. Boy, that's, that's an interesting question. There's, I'll answer it like this. I think there's the book is in three acts. The second act, which covers by far the longest stretch of time. It covers I don't know, 15 years of time. It covers a long time. It's by far the shortest section in the book. And the reason for that is that was the section in which his film covered. So I wanted to be able to honor his films and to allow room for his films. So if you wanted to, you could read the first act of this book, put down the book for a week, uh, watch all of his movies, and then come back to the book. So I've inserted a, a kind of a spot for that. Well, that's great. So I, I kind of like how uh, I was able to, to construct that act, it, because that's the second act is pretty much all me. It's going off of things that I, I understood George was interested in. And essentially, there was a lot of George in Act One and Act Three, and Act Two was a way of I had to somehow combine them. I had to I had to bridge them, and so there's a lot of me in that way, and it's it's fun because I get to sort of skim off the top of all this Romero knowledge that. I and many other people have gained over the years. Um, and it's fun to sort of sum up the Romero verse in that way. Um, so that's, that's a, a big component of something that feels like me. Largely the character, one of the major characters in the book, Greer, is largely my invention. She eventually meets a character called Muse. And that was George's character, but there was a, for various reasons, it didn't make sense to start, to start with me. So mm -hmm. I had to get, get to me somehow. So, um, the character Greer is another, another character who feels specifically me. It's going to be hard to, when you're reading it yourself and you go, that's me, that's George, that's kind of George, that's more me, that's... It's, it's well, it's, 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 it's impossible, uh, and it should be, you know, mm -hmm. what, what happens is that once I start editing, you know, once I've, I've, let's say I've written an entire draft of the book, and now it's time for me to edit it. At that point, you lose complete, you lose total uh, co concept of what sentence was mine and what sentence was George. Now you're just editing the book, um, and you're changing, you're changing things all over the place. And by the time, you know, the book's editor has edited it, and you're doing your fourth draft, there's just no telling anymore. It's, it's very hard with, with, you know, certain exceptions, like I mentioned, it's very hard to know, uh, at this point, I, I couldn't tell you, if you point to a sentence in the book, I probably can't tell you that was entirely mine or George's or partially both. That's good then. That's what you want. Right? Yeah. I think it's, I think it's good. You just, you just, it just flows away and becomes a piece of art. All right. I know I got to let you go here in a few minutes, but I want to do some quick questions. These are important and very important questions in regards to the zombie That's world. Sure. Okay. Fast or slow? What's your zombie preference? Oh, come on. <laughs> slow. <laughs> do you feel like the fast are a little bit of a cheat? Romero hated fast zombies uh -huh. and he was very rational, practical about his zombies. He, they're, they're falling apart. They're rotting. They're not going to be able to run. He didn't like the idea that they would ever be after brains because skulls are hard to crack and they wouldn't do that. They would, they would go for the softer matter that's easier to get to. You know, that kind of 
just that whole statement ruins my whole love of anything where they're fast or they're going for brains now. I'm like, you're right. That's well, a good question. they're just more fantastical. <laughs> they do get into those skulls really easy. Yeah, and skulls are not easy to get into. <laughs> so what's Take it from me. <laughs> <laughs> You've tried? Yeah, all the time. So what's more terrifying to you, zombie people or zombie animals? Uh, uh, people, I think. I think uh, animals will maintain certain animal aspects, which would probably include keeping to themselves, where I think, uh, you know, zombies always have a trace of their old selves. And I think zombie people will, unfortunately, tend to do what zombie, what regular people do, which is move into other people's areas and try to take them over. Okay. Here's, here's a, one that I was very curious since you've done all this research. What, what do zombie properties today miss when they're trying to emulate Romero's work? What they get wrong? Well, they, they, they focus on the gore and the, I mean, George was really not interested in that stuff. Zombies are a great way. Zombies are the perfect catalyst. They're, they're very unspecific threat that forces humans to interact in panic ways. You know, I just don't have a, although I like zombies as much as the next guy, I'm not a just straight up zombie fan. I don't, I don't seek out zombie movies and zombie books just because they have zombies. And I, I have no interest in that. Uh, my interest has always been specifically Romero, whether it was zombie movies or not, any movie he made. So yeah, I think I think pr- practitioners of the zombie genre are getting most of it wrong, or, or at least for my particular palette. All right. So, <laughs> zombie, undead, walker. I mean, what do you call them? Like on, on your own time, what do you call them? Well, for most of the book, uh, we call them ghouls. You know, in *I'm Living Dead*, that's what they were called. Zom- the word "zombie" isn't uttered until late in *Dawn of the Dead*. And they were called ghouls for the opening of the outbreak. And so the first chunk of the book, which is, you know, several hundred pages, takes place over two weeks. And so for that stretch of time, it makes sense for all sorts of different people in all sorts of corners of the country, calling them something different. But the word that catches on is ghoul. So I call them zombies like everyone else does, but uh, I'm affectionate to the word ghoul. All right. And uh, this one is is personal and well, no, it's mostly personal. So you have just watched all of the Romero movies. Outside of Night of the Living Dead, two questions. What is your favorite Romero film outside of Night of the Living Dead? And any, I mean, it can be creep show, whatever it is. And also, what is just Daniel's overall favorite movie? I'm just curious. Outside, if we're talking zombie films outside Night of the Living Dead that Romero made, it would probably be Day of the Dead with uh, a certain soft spot that I have for his last film, Survival of the Dead. Uh, As far as if we're we're saying zombie movies are out of the category, my favorite Romero film is probably Creepshow, um, which I'm borderline obsessed with. But again, with a soft spot for Martin, which was his favorite movie, and, you know, is arguably his most perfectly constructed film. It's a fantastic film. Oh, and my favorite movie of all time, uh, if, you, if you take out Night of the Living Dead, because that's, that's the answer. Uh, God, I don't even know. Well, I mean, yeah. if that's the answer, that's the answer. I just, I just didn't want you to be beholden to Romero. I just wanted to leave it open. Oh, no, uh, I, yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, that would be the answer. I mean, I, I certainly have so many horror movies that I uh, love, but, you know, it's like I've seen Night of the Living Dead. 500 times and the next one down is probably like i've seen it five times you know, it's like, there's, a, there's <laughs> a, a chasm a big difference between that and everything else yeah you know what's funny it's most people don't you you mentioned that tidbit at the very top of this interview about the whole the copyright issue most people don't know that the the night of the living dead i think it was what the flesh eaters or something and they changed the title and that's why they lost the copyright right yeah it was first called a uh, night of anubis and then it was called Night of the Flesh Eaters. And then when the Walter Reed organization, I think it was called, picked up the film for dist- uh, distribution, they changed it to Night of the Living Dead, probably wisely, uh, and forgot to put the little copyright signifier on it, which seems like a ridiculous loophole. Yeah, but it's not fair. It, it made the movie uh, free to show. 
And so that was a double-edged sword. On the one hand, Romero missed out on millions, millions of dollars, probably. Uh, and he was never really in the money. So that would have been fortuitous for him. But on the other hand, it made the film uh, a massive hit because it was just shown everywhere all the time. Uh, and I don't think there's any way it would have been, it would have become as famous as it did if it had been properly copywritten. Yeah. And that makes sense. I mean, it is a double-edged sword. I feel, I feel horrible for Romero on the same token. That might be why his popularity has extended for so many years. Just be just be, it's kind of yeah. like the same Rocky Horror Picture it, Show, same kind of thing. I mean, it just exploded in a different form. Yeah. It's, it's difficult to, uh, to kind of game out what his career would have been had it been copywritten correctly. It's impossible to say. He might not have been pigeonholed as much. That's possible. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. Very true. So what's next for you, Daniel? What are you doing after you've got this in the bag and it's hopefully going to sell really well? What's next for you? Well, I have, um, this comes out in August and it's just September. So one month after I've got two things coming out. It's been a very busy year for me. I've got a, my first middle grade book which is called They Threw Us Away. And it's the first of a trilogy called The Teddy Saga. And it is about teddy bears, which seems like the opposite of <laughs> a thing that I would write about. But it's not. It is uh, it is the darkest teddy bear story you can imagine. Um, and it, it's sort of my homage to, well, it is sort of. It's a direct homage to uh, Watership Down, which is a very important book to me growing up. Um, except instead of uh, bunny rabbits, it's uh, teddy bears. And the teddy bears wake up in a dump, a trash dump, a city dump. And uh, they, they wake up and they're alive. They don't know why they're alive. And they don't know why they were thrown away. And so they start this three-book journey back into the city to figure out what they did wrong to get uh, thrown away. Because they're all brand new. Uh, very, very cool story with some gorgeous sort of dark illustrations. Uh, I, I'm real excited about that one. And then at the end of September, I have a, my first comic book coming out from Vault Comics. Um, it's an eight issue series called The Autumnal. And it's folk horror, I guess. Um, and uh, Chris Sheehan does the art and it's just fantastic. Um, and I'm super psyched about that too. That's awesome. And then what's, are you working on stuff for next year i mean this must be an author's paradise because you could just write 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 yeah i mean it, it is true that the pandemic hasn't affected my day-to-day -day business much i'm still just sitting here writing all the time mm -hmm. uh you know i have two other teddy's books since that's a trilogy so i'm working on those and i've got at least four other projects that i haven't been announced yet so i can't talk about them yet understood well, I got to let you go. Thank you so much for doing this. Anything you want to say as a last last ditch sales pitch for people to go run out and buy this book? I just say it's out August 4th. Um, and if you pre-order it and from anywhere, it doesn't matter where you get it. If you pre-order it, there's a site at Macmillan. You can probably find it via my, my website or social media. Um, and you can, in, you can upload your receipt and they'll send you an exclusive poster that a, a great artist has made for Living Dead. And the only way to get that is to pre-order the book. That's so please fantastic. do. That's fantastic. All right, man. Well, best of luck. Great work. I mean, you've, you've done something that most people probably would be terrified to even take on and you've done it. You've done it very well. So congratulations on this. Sincerely. Thank you very much. All right, Daniel, you take care and best of luck. We'll see you when the, when the movie right. comes out. <laughs> okay. Thanks, man. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. There you go, guys. That was an interview with Daniel Cross. I hope you enjoyed it. Once again, book is great. I'm not just saying that because I wouldn't want you to read. Reading, who reads? You should. You should read this book as soon as you can. It's great. And it really concludes, if you're a zombie fan, Night of the Living Dead fan, it gives that world a solid conclusion that you're going to want to see for yourself. And I'm not going to spoil anything. So I hope you guys enjoyed the interview. I hope you really enjoyed the book. Don't forget to pre-order it. Links are in the show notes. You can always find us at thehollywoodoutsider.com. And remember, the next time you go to a theater or a bookstore to buy The Living Dead, buy popcorn.